Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Keeping It Real with Janine, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life. I'm Janine Strong, and today I'm having an inspiring conversation with Sarah McCrum. As Sarah states on her website, my work with money started in 2010 when I found myself spontaneously writing a message from money in my notebook. The first thing it said was, I would like to tell you to love me. It continued by saying, I'm an energy. I am very powerful and beautiful. I am an incredible web of connections. I am not the devil. I never have been. I connect human beings with each other. That's pretty cool. She was given precise instructions on how to heal her relationship with money, and this evolved into writing the book, Love Money, Money Loves You. It's a playbook for the new economy. It points the way towards a world that works for all of us. It shows us how we can live in a society that is fundamentally based on love, generosity, and a deep understanding of the essence of humanity. Wow, Sarah, you've taken on a very controversial subject. Welcome to my podcast. Thank you very much. Yes, I probably had no idea <laughs> what I was doing, which is lucky. <laughs> yes, yes, I think very often that's the case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sometimes if we if we knew, we wouldn't move forward. <laughs> oh, that's right. And I maintain that to this day. There's a certain kind of um, an air of innocence that I just, keep it's like no I know what I'm doing there's this very pure message about money and I'm not going to get involved in all the stories around the world Mm -hmm. about what money is or it isn't I'm just going to stay with this this essence Um, because otherwise I think I would go crazy in a couple of days well I I do understand that because I mean money is such a controversial topic and and there are so many I mean, I've often said if you if you feel jealous of people who do have wealth or you resent them, how do you expect to improve your financial situation if that's what your underlying belief is about money? Exactly. And that's just one of the many, many, many underlying beliefs. And of course, there are also many people who are wealthy who feel guilty about it or yes. ashamed in some way. And so um, at, at every level, I find there's so much rejection and fear around money that what, what happens is that if we make it, we get a very distorted relationship with it. Mm-hmm. And if we don't make it, we have a very distorted relationship with it. So it's not really surprising that some of the things we do in the name of business and money end up, I think, being rather distorted from a more natural way of living and being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would agree. And especially if you're spiritual, if what you're doing, the way you would like to earn your living is it, it has a spiritual context to it, then I mean, I remember when I was younger and earning a living, doing spiritual different activities, reading tarot cards, different things like that, that, you know, you're not supposed to make money being doing spiritual things. You're supposed to give it away. Exactly. And I meet people every single day who have a really serious issue with asking for money for doing very high quality and valuable work because of exactly that. And I've looked at that a lot because I just figured out that across the world, this is not only a Western thing, it's Western and Eastern. There are so many associations of virtue with poverty And it seems to me Mm. that at the root, there's this kind of schism that comes out in many of us, which is if I'm going to be a good person or do good, then I have to reject money because if I if I opt for the money way, then I'm opting for evil or just for not a virtuous life, just like a household, an ordinary life. And um, it's somehow always made to look inferior to engage with money. And so I think that creates a really deep dilemma for people who are spiritual. Well, I know for myself, I've always felt that I haven't made my choices by how much money something would bring in for what I want to do. I do things because I want to do it and I love to do it. And I guess I just kind of assume that 
the money's going to follow because I'm doing what I want to do. I'm happy doing it and I love doing it. And that's pretty much what um, one of the first things that that my book really said or that money said through my book. It, it has this whole section teaching us really simply how to ask for what we want. And in its essence, it's being able to say, I'd love to do that or I'd love to create that. I'd love to experience that. And then not saying, but I can't because, but mm -hmm. just leaving it at that, I would love to. And that's what creates the conditions for money to follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I know like right now, okay, so we're in the, the midst of the COVID pandemic and a lot of people are having to reevaluate how they're going to make a living and be creative, come up with some different, you know, different ways of, of doing things and trying to figure out what can they do to earn a living. And how do you see that as, you know, because it's, it's different, it's a little bit different now than it, it was before this outbreak. Yes, it is really different. There are a couple of things. If if you think about just what you said there about how am I going to make a living, what will happen um, is that people have to start to look at what is it of value that they can share with other people. And it's interesting because we probably live in a time where uh, many people struggle with self-esteem um, and you know, marketing messaging and social media have contributed to that to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's actually a really good thing that, that we're going to need to look at the whole question of value because m exchanging money or making money is about exchanging value. Right. And you have to understand what is the value of what you have to share in the world? And maybe your real value is not what you did in your job that you've just lost, but actually the real value you have to share is something else. So I think that that in itself is a very interesting exercise. And COVID has given so many people so much time to reflect. This is a further reflection. The other thing is that... Um, what I can see, and I'm seeing this emerging, is new ways of uh, creating value in the world. So work that hasn't been valued in the past mm -hmm. um, could become more valuable. I, I see the beginnings now of new systems growing whereby we can sell things in a different way and share things in a different way. For years and years, we've had alternative currencies, local currencies and things like that. I think we're going to see much more sophisticated ways emerging um, that virtually create new economies within the big economy, mm -hmm. um, not only local, because a lot of it will be digital, right. and new ways of exchanging what we have to offer um, that are much richer and much more multidimensional than we have been used to in the past. Mm -hmm. Somebody said to me in a class this morning, actually, he said, oh my goodness, Sarah, I've just realized that our way of measuring money in cash, in a number, is completely wrong. That it's far more multi multi-dimensional than that. And I saw he was kind of getting it, that it is about value. And there are many ways that we can um, share value and contribute to the well-being of other people and all of that invokes the money energy which is what i was writing about so it's much much richer and there's far more opportunity than it appears if you look like oh i've lost my job there are no jobs around what on earth am i going to do so what would you that's a great I, I was thinking about this and what you just <laughs> what you just said is a great segue <laughs> for so what what how what might you say or how might you coach someone who they have lost their job they don't know what to do they're kind of at their wits end they're maybe getting depressed to, to start looking in a different direction or to start thinking differently uh, the first thing that I would teach somebody to do is to relax about money um, and to understand what money really is that money really is energy. It's not just energy. Sometimes people say money is just energy in a very dismissive way. It's not just energy. It's an exquisitely beautiful energy that is, it's a loving, generous energy, and it is actually available to all of us. And most of us don't know how to connect with it very well. We don't know how to relate with it because we've never learned. It's never been emphasized in any way. 
But one of the very powerful things about learning about money is that you realize that you can start to bypass the system in quotes. And therefore, if there aren't any jobs available, that doesn't mean there's no opportunity. It means that you need to create a different relationship with money. So first, it's relaxing learning about money and what it really is, and then learning how to connect with what you want, like you said, what you would love to experience, and how to receive that. And that's what I learned in my book, and that's what I have practiced many times in the early days. I didn't have any money, and I often couldn't pay the rent, stuff like that. And I used what I learned in the book to ask for the money to pay the rent. And the amazing thing is that it really worked over and over. Now, from there, I learned how to get to a point where I'm not worried about rent anymore. And then, you know, it's bigger things. Mm -hmm. And then you grow beyond that and it becomes bigger things. But the point is that the principle works from very, very small, um, very small amounts of money all the way up to big amounts. So wherever you are, if you learn those basic things to relax, to know what money really is, and to be able to ask for and receive what you would love to have or to experience, you can build the foundation of a new relationship with money where money starts to flow through your life, possibly in some unexpected ways, probably not going to look exactly like the job that you might have had before, but that is usually way more satisfying, actually. Yes. Yes. So, so what is money exactly besides energy? <laughs> um, so another way of looking at it is it's a bit like a, an energy system, a system. Okay. Um, really it's, if I'm really honest, it's a kind of system of wish fulfillment. It's a system that it's also a system of materialization so as human beings, it appears, and I didn't know this before, that when we um, wish for something, we, it's, there is really kind of like a system, like where that gets heard. Um, I think of it as a kind of bureaucracy in the sky. It's, it's a bit <laughs> of a childlike image, but I really see it a bit like that. It's a huge, great kind of divine bureaucracy organization where there are lots and lots and lots and lots of beings and their job that their, their simple role is to serve humanity for some reason they've landed this role in this lifetime or however it works mm -hmm. to serve human beings and they hear what we're thinking about and what we're feeling and they interpret that as requests or kind of commands into consciousness mm -hmm. and if we're asking for something and we do it openly um and and kind of clearly then their job is to deliver it. And it really is rather like that. It's like ordering something on online and you need to fulfill the conditions. So if you say, look, I want a T-shirt, but I don't know what size I want, and you don't click the size, you can't fulfill the order. Right. But if you can clarify what it is you're looking for, I want a T-shirt, I want it size medium, blue with pink dots on it, and I want it to be sent to this address and you pay the money and you keep your letterbox open and you don't go away and live somewhere else. You know, you, you fulfill all the conditions uh -huh. and then the parcel will be delivered to you. But if you leave bits of it out, it won't. So if you say, look, I really want a T-shirt, but I just can't afford to buy one. You don't buy a T-shirt. You never click the button. You never get the T-shirt. You could say, I really want a T-shirt. I haven't got enough money this week, but when I've got some money, I'll buy one. And then you'll get it, but you'll get it a bit later. It's kind of pretty much works like that, but it's a little bit less tangible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my next question then would be, um, let's see, how do I want to word this? So it sounds to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like, um, do you need to be like really detailed about what you want? Because I've often thought that, I mean, my method for me is I will put out there sort of the general idea of what I want, but I will let my team, the universe, whatever, fill in the blanks and and help me to discover or bring into my uh, my field what's best for me. Where... Yes, so I don't, 
I don't think you need to be very detailed unless it's something very specific. Sometimes, like there have been times when there was a very specific amount of money I needed mm. because I needed to be able to pay for something immediately. I had, you know, there was no choice about it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I would ask very specifically. But uh, most of the time, what I prefer to do is clarify the bigger picture, right. um, the direction, the purpose, like the bigger goal. And then there are many, and, and I always ask, I always say whenever I'm asking for something or clarifying something um, or something better. So I always leave yes. space for something better than I can imagine. I found that if I, if I kind of do the best I can mm -hmm. um, and don't deny my own wishes, the, the biggest problem most people have is they say, oh, I don't really know what I want or I don't want anything. And they just deny that whole system within themselves. But as long as I kind of do my best, and and really uh, look at the the bigger picture that works better for me. And then yes, just like you describe, then a lot of smaller things are just part of delivering the bigger thing, and so they happen automatically. Also, I often find things like I say, oh, I'd really like to meet that person, or I'll say I'd love to do another podcast, and then so a, a podcast interview invitation comes in, or I I get introduced to that person really soon. <laughs> Many things work for me like that, but they're really big a part of a part of my bigger purpose. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you do you find do you feel that you're highly intuitive? Um, yes, I suppose I am. Um, I, I don't think that I was when I was I, I think when I was young, I was sensitive, but intellectual, very in, I was educated very well and um so that probably shut down a lot of it but the sensitivity was underneath um so that became more a bit of a kind of rumbling inner suffering for no particular reason i think that like, just having to shut down quite a lot of myself without understanding why and by doing i learned a lot about energy Later in my life, I trained for many years with energy masters, mm -hmm. and so I was constantly exposed to energy fields. When I st first started, I couldn't feel anything at all. It took me weeks before I felt anything. Um, so that kind of shows how much I was shut down. But I think because I've done so much energy work, I've actually opened up an incredible, rich array of intuition um, now. And so, yes. Uh, it, it's not a word I use very much. I probably mm -hmm. see it in a little bit of a different way. But I do experience things at a very energetic level and a sort of multi-sensory, multi-dimensional level. Um, so, yes, that, that that's probably my equivalent. Mm -hmm. Well, and I find that um, that when you pay attention to those intuitive hits that you get, whether they're uh, you feel something or you sense something, uh, when you pay attention and act on it, 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 to me, it's almost like the, you know, the team gets excited because you're paying attention and you're acting and you get more and more and more. It, it, it kind of snowballs, but if you ignore it, um, then it, it just, it kind of stops. Yeah. I guess it's like a relationship in a way when you, it's like, if you listen to your partner, Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get better communication and yeah. there's more shared between you and if you always ignore them um I, I see it very much like that I see that like I need to show up and they show up and the more I show up it, it's like it, it all goes together mm -hmm. yes right I think that's a good way to put it so so how do you ask is there a, a particular method that you use when you're you're asking to manifest something or you're asking for the money that you need um I, I find that different people uh tend to find slightly different ways everybody needs to find what works for them okay. the thing that's worked best for me there are a couple of things that I do one is if I really need something um I'll just sit really quietly and I'll just say please please bring me two thousand dollars or whatever you know that, mm -hmm. that I used to do that quite a lot and that's it that's all I would do okay um nothing nothing after that it's just like the most low-key um way of imaginable and I've found that extremely effective the thing that I do more nowadays is 
is I, it's more like I just talk things into existence. So I talk about things that I want to create. Okay. In a certain way, there's a certain energy about it, and then they tend to happen. Hmm. Hmm. And once you've done that, do you have to kind of like let it go? So the first way, the asking way, it's almost like there's nothing to let go. It's let go in that moment. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, that that's it's so low key that that even letting go feels like a bit too much. Of you do, I, it, there is a kind of letting go of it because it's definitely not something to think about again. Mm-hmm. It's just ask, and that's it. Mm-hmm. In the other way, the creating, it's different. It's a different thing. It's more like just keep building and building and building. I just keep talking about what I'm creating and growing it and evolving it. And it's that talking that does the creating. I I, I understand it more almost like that's just commanding things into consciousness. And what I find is most of the time people talk about stuff that they don't want their life to be like right. their conversations. If you imagine how powerful your conversations are, this is what I discovered. You don't want to talk about what you don't want to happen. Mm-hmm. You may need to acknowledge it's fine to acknowledge that there are some very unpleasant things going on in life. So I'm not talking about denial of that. If you deny it, you lose all your inner power. Mm-hmm. But when you can acknowledge what's going on and then start to move into solving it and creating a better reality it's incredibly powerful to be able to do that and that's um that's a bit different from the kind of making a wish and letting it go kind of approach so so how do you recommend that people uh, do that because i i know it, sometimes it's it's not easy to get out of like spinning negative thoughts or you know but I mean most people know more about what they don't want than what they want well that's really helpful if you know what you don't want you probably know what you want usually if somebody says oh I don't want this you can say oh so what do you want instead and you can catch them out and they'll tell you without even noticing Mm -hmm. so that's actually quite useful to know what you don't want Um, because you probably can switch it around. I think the biggest thing is what I said earlier is about relaxing, actually. It's when you relax that you start to let go of all that old stuff. The, The way I teach people to relax they're receiving, they open up so they receive new energy. This is because I trained for so long with Chinese masters. And the thing about the receiving of that new energy is it pushes out the old energy. And the old energy is all the old stuff old thoughts, old experiences, old memories. And so as you let go of those, you actually naturally feel more present, um, fresher in a way. And so that makes it much easier to connect with who you are and what you want and that more spontaneous self that's inside you. Okay, so let's say that someone... <clears throat> they have they've lost their job they they've had maybe a an avocation or a hobby or something that they really enjoy doing and they want to they want to make a living out of it what kind of steps would you take someone through to help them to create their reality um so the first thing that i think is is useful is to be really grounded about it Just because you want to make a living out of your hobby doesn't necessarily mean that that's a really easy thing to do. Right. Okay. Um, That's why hobbies are usually hobbies, um, (laughs) because they're not easy to make a living out of. It doesn't mean that it's impossible to do it. So um, I think that first of all, you have to be very grounded that if if you want to make a hobby, your hobby into a living, can you afford to do that right now? Or actually, are you in an urgent situation about money? If you're in an urgent situation about money, you have to find money first. You have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And you can't just say, yeah, but I want to do my hobby and be broke. So if it's urgent about money, engage with the money system and ask for money, ask for whatever will help you to do that. Um, And I say that because so many people, I meet so many people who are desperately trying to make a living doing something that they love and they're really not succeeding and they're not 
They're not seeing clearly. And often they're rejecting opportunities to work and make some money that would enable them to do more of what they love. So you have to be very grounded and very real. If you're determined to make a living out of your hobby and you're not literally right like on the edge you can manage financially you don't need very much but if you can manage then look one thing that is really simple that most people don't want to hear me say is you do actually need to learn a bit about business and the tricky thing about that is that a lot of teaching about business is a bit old school it doesn't really take account of this new consciousness of money but you do need to understand the principles of business because you're still going to need to make things and sell them or something like that you're going to have to have something to sell because that's how you make a living with things on the whole right or Um, provide a service or -hmm. or provide a service or something there are new ways coming along there are new ways that will come up but they're not ready yet so I don't really want to talk about that because it's a bit misleading um, because people can be really in trouble now you know we're not just talking about um, oh I don't quite have enough money you may really desperately need money so um if if you're willing to learn the business side and many people are having to do that at the moment and there are many courses that will teach you the other side of it is your relationship with money so so what about if if a person is trying to create a new relationship a new healthier relationship with money it would seem to me that they have to deal with their underlying beliefs about money that they've grown up with. And how do you help people with that? Um, One of the things I tend not to do is spend too much time looking at beliefs. They come up from time to time. I, I think the most useful way to do it is one is to learn to relax because that helps you to let go of a lot of old beliefs automatically. You don't need to examine them or anything. They just come out and okay. go out. Okay. That's really useful. The other thing is that the more you learn about money and what money really is, if it resonates with you, which it does for a lot of people, it replaces your old beliefs. So if you learn that money is a beautiful, generous energy, and you might have believed before that money was something that's really hard to come by and, you know, difficult. Mm -hmm. When, When you learn that new belief, it resonates so strongly for many people that it actually starts to replace the old belief automatically. So you can pay more attention to the learning. In my early practice with this, I remember kind of fighting inside myself and saying, well, what if my book's not true? You know, what if what if I'm just imagining things? And I remember saying, yeah, but I want to believe in it. I want to believe that the world works like this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that was enough. Every single time I did that, I got a really good result. So it's engaging with the new beliefs is far more important than agonizing over the old ones. Mm -hmm. So so let's say a person wants to, you know, they they have a hobby or they have something that they really want to do, but they need money right now and it's going to take time to build their their dream. And but they don't want to work at something that they don't really want to do, but perhaps doing that is going to lead to maybe meeting someone who can help them or an opportunity that will help to move them forward. In my experience, life is always that way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've taught a lot of people who are still in a job that they don't like and wishing they could be doing something else, I've just taught them to to really appreciate the energy that they're receiving through that job specifically in the form of money. Mm-hmm. Often there's a lot else as well. And the minute they start to appreciate it, things start to happen. Opportunities start to show up, whatever it is that they're looking for. And um, I, I've learned that we do really need to be very practical. And so, like I said, if you do need a job or you do need to find some money, not from the perfect source, if you can do that and appreciate it and be grateful for it, it is quite remarkable what will open up for you. And that's far more important than having exactly the perfect job or doing exactly the perfect thing. Um, that gratitude creates currency. It creates flow, which actually is, is money. Right. That, in fact, that's what I was just going to say. It sounds like gratitude is really an important piece of the puzzle here. It makes an enormous difference. And appreciation. Appreci- what you appreciate, appreciates. So whenever you appreciate something, it grows. 
And when you can appreciate anything that's working in your life, even if you're getting money from a horrible job, appreciate the money. And things, the good things grow from that. I think that's really important because it's it's easy to get bogged down into into you know you don't want to do this you you want to do something else you want to live somewhere else you want to be somewhere else you you know and uh, how how can you I guess maybe gratitude goes out the door but you need to hold on to the gratitude while focus you can still focus on wanting change but be grateful for where you are at the same time yes because the thing is that if you're constantly living in oh i wish i was somewhere else uh, I, I talked a little earlier about conversation and how creative that is so there's a conversation then going on in your head saying i wish i was somewhere else i wish i was somewhere better what you're creating in that moment is this constant experience of wishing you were somewhere else um, and so what has to happen, the, the money system, if you like, they have to keep delivering you that experience that you're creating, which is the experience of wishing you were somewhere else. So you keep on experiencing being really um, unhappy with where you are. So it's actually really important to be able to say, I wish I was somewhere else. I don't like where I'm living. I'm in the process of creating that next step. And in order to create it, I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to ask for it and I'm going to do other things and I'm going to appreciate where I am for now. And with that kind of open hearted, sort of rather healthy, wholesome attitude, it becomes a lot easier to change where you live as well. So it, it, it all comes in one package. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, you know, on and off, like I've been thinking, oh, I'd rather live by the ocean. And of course, with all this COVID thing, I'm glad I'm here right now. <laughs> <laughs> hardly anybody wears masks and everybody's pretty laid back so I'm like oh thank goodness well, exactly <laughs> <laughs> so you never know you know maybe that's why I'm here right now uh, so that I can I can appreciate it and I can be in a different kind of a I guess society almost but you know if I had oh, how do I want to say this you know if I had just like pushed ahead and done something that wasn't very realistic, you know, that, that can be harmful. Yes. Uh, when we, when we try to force energy, mm -hmm. we create a, a counter force. And, um, most, a lot of the time we live very forceful lives and then you get this kind of energy pushing against you. So it makes it much harder. A lot of what I've learned through the relaxation is, is not to force, but to find a kind of natural, a natural energy and life seems a lot kinder mm -hmm. when, when we're kinder to it it's kinder to us when you're kinder to yourself and about yourself also you find life is kinder to you and sometimes that means just being kind about where you are your current situation and not not being so hard about it and and then you discover all kinds of value in where you are um, so, so it becomes a better experience and at the same time, because you're appreciating more, it does become easier for you to change what you don't like. Isn't that fascinating? That, that, that seems like it's a, I don't want to say an oxymoron, but you know, it, 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 yeah, it, it, it is, it's really fascinating and it sounds like it's a mind trick, but it's not a mind trick. This is actually, this comes from really being sincere mm -hmm. um, that's the power of it if you try to do all these things as mind tricks as many people have learned they don't actually work very well and it's exhausting you have to work really hard all the time to control your mind but what I'm talking about is something that's much gentler and softer and kinder and more loving and it just works because of that so yeah it's very um it's, it's, it's more generous in its spirit. And, and so it becomes about being kinder to yourself as well. And that softness, I think even as I speak about it, maybe you can feel how it, it just, it opens you. It makes you feel more inviting to life. And that's actually more inviting to money as well. Mm -hmm. I like that, inviting to life. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? That seems important. <laughs> well, 
I guess very often we feel rather defensive about life. It feels like life beats us around and serves us very difficult situations to deal with. And so we can often feel that life is against us. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, you often hear life is hard. Life is hard, yes. If I look back on my life, the hardest things that I've experienced have also been the greatest gifts to me. And many, many people say that. Mm -hmm. My sister died when I was 30 of a brain tumor. Mm. And at the time it happened, it felt like my whole world was falling apart. But if I look at what I have experienced and learned and the opportunities that have happened to me because of that, I can't even say I wish it hadn't happened. It's almost like I can see where I would have gone without that. And I can see the gift that she gave me um, through that to open up all of the work that I do now and to open me up to whole worlds that I was really completely unaware of. And I see many people say the same kinds of things. And so even in the difficult moments where we want to feel that life is against us, I learned to understand that somehow life is not. Life is actually it's kind of like it's behind me all the time. It's, it's got my back all the time. It's just that I can't see it (laughs) at times. And that softened my attitude a lot. And then I began to be able to respond much more quickly. So when life throws something at me that feels really hard, I learned that there's always a gift in it. And so I start to look for that immediately rather than waiting till six months later or a year later when I've sort of recovered from the blow. Mm -hmm. And 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 as as I did that, and I don't do that by denying the the hardness or the feeling of it, or I, I don't do it by a kind of Pollyanna. Oh, everything's fine, really, because that doesn't work. <laughs> right. It doesn't work at all. Right. But but I have found that even in the hardest situations, that they're such a gift, and life is, works so much better when I understand that. And actually, there are less of those hard situations anyway. Mm-hmm. And so the more I've softened and opened up my own understanding of it, the more my experience of it has also softened and, and been gentler towards me. So it seems like we really are extraordinarily powerful mm-hmm. um, through our, our thoughts and our feelings and what we talk about and what we expect. Mm-hmm. It's, it is extraordinarily powerful. It, it sounds like it's, it's kind of circuitous. It, it keeps building. Yes, it, exactly. Mm-hmm. And exactly. getting better. So it sounds like gratitude, appreciation, sincerity are all really important aspects of this. Yes, and generosity, mm-hmm. which means being generous to yourself as well as to other people. Mm-hmm. Well, you almost have to start with yourself. If you don't like yourself, if you hate yourself, if you, um, you know, if you, if you if you don't feel good about yourself, it's hard to feel good in the macrocosm, right? If you're not feeling good in the That's microcosm. That's right. But many, many people try to be generous you know they give all the time and they don't allow themselves to receive and that's very exhausting Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it it, it runs out in the end and it's confusing i i meet many women who and and some men as well actually who are very confused by that because they really believed that as long as they were generous then life would be generous to them and they don't understand why it didn't happen and it looks like a bit of a contradiction to um, what I was saying before, but it's not. It's that the generosity needs to include you. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've often said to people, if you don't allow yourself to receive, you're depriving someone else of giving to you. Exactly. And the world actually just doesn't work if we all give and we don't receive. (laughs) It doesn't work at all. It's actually the more we're willing to receive and the more we're willing to give, the more generous we are at both ends, then the more the world, we, we all get to experience the benefit of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. That makes sense. If there's, if there's nobody to receive, then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have parcels piling up all over doorsteps. <laughs> it's waste. That's a good analogy. I like that. So it sounds like 
from everything you've said, you, you keep coming back to relaxing. Yes. Um, so how do you recommend people actually do that? I mean, it's an awesome concept, but somebody might say, so how do I do that? I'm stressed all the time or there's just, yeah. uh, there's so much to do and the, the day ends and I still haven't gotten to half my list or whatever. Um, I, I teach relaxation because, because of that, because it's one of those tricky things. I always wish I could have a special word for it and make it into a thing. <laughs> um, but it never really works because that obscures the simplicity of it. It really is as simple as relaxing. Um, I think it is, it is something that it's worth learning, but also at, at its essence, relaxing is doing nothing. Um, for most people who are really busy, like if you really want to challenge yourself on, on a Saturday morning or sometime when you've got some time, just say, okay, I'm going to spend two hours and I'm actually going to do nothing. Nothing? And nothing. nothing. Just sit, just sit and do nothing. Wow. It's very I nice. don't know if I could do that. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd be, li I could listen to something or read or, but do nothing at all. Yeah, exactly. Can't even meditate? Better to do nothing. Wow. Just sit there? How about go for a walk? No. Is that, no? <laughs> no. As you can I see, I'm having nothing. trouble with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, um, I, I do, I actually do this sometimes, but I create recordings where I lead people in relaxation. I actually lead them to do nothing. And they're listening to something, so they feel that there's, there's enough of the doing in there or there's enough of the occupation that, that we can get away with it. And it speeds it up. You, you know, you can't do two hours every day of doing nothing. Um, but it's a remarkable thing to do that because after a little while, what happens is you start to soften. You, you actually do start to relax. And what you'll notice if you, if, if you can be aware of it is that as you soften and relax, you start to receive energy. You start to feel like you're being fed by something, literally. It's like very gentle, but it's, it's giving you something. That energy that feeds you when you relax also removes the old energy. It removes toxins from your body. It removes old thoughts, old things you were told by your mom that are not relevant anymore, old memories that are also not relevant anymore, old beliefs, all kinds of stuff. So energy is the natural cleanser and healer of our systems. And the way we live at the moment when we're so busy and so rushed and forcing things so much means that we're actually denying of ourselves of a great deal of the energy that is naturally available. So um, to, to learn to relax, truly relax, which is not reading a book, it's not having a glass of wine, <laughs> it's not sitting in front of the television, it's not going for a walk. It's actually doing nothing, allowing your whole system to relax, all your internal organs, all your, your mind, your heart, your soul, all of it, just let your whole being relax. It is the most kind of nothing action. It's the most nothing kind of doing, um, but it, it is extraordinarily powerful and beautiful and simple and to me it's the foundation of all um of 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 all transformation oh, that's fascinating so sarah what what do you recommend that people do with thoughts that come up oh thoughts are old energy coming out okay. if they come up when you're relaxing so it is just let them go but you don't need to do something to let them go um, don't freak out about them for sure. The more you freak out about them, the stronger they become. Mm. But it's fine that thoughts come up. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's quite natural. They're also not the most important thing that's going on in the world. They're ah. very, un <laughs> very unimportant. <laughs> Interesting. So now you said you have med you have meditations recorded to help people in this way. Yes, I have a lot. Ah. <laughs> Over a thousand of them. What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. Wow. Um, and are they available on your website? Yes, I have um, on on my website, and also I have a course platform. I have collections. I call them activations. 
I saw the activations. I thought those looked really interesting. I'm going to try. Yes. That. And every course that I have has um, relaxations and activations. They're, they're, all re they're all very relaxing experiences, but they, you can relax into experiencing more love, for example, or self-love. So they all have a, a topic to them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're based on this deep practice of relaxation. So, yes, I have lots of those available um, on my website and on my course platform. And they're built into every course that I teach. Mm -hmm. So my course about money, which is called Thank You Money, obviously, <laughs> good, the good title for what we've been talking about, yeah. um, has 20. The first month you get 20 relaxations. Like it's a real training program for you to find this space because when you relax you're more receptive when you're more receptive opportunities come to you ideas come to you people come to you and money comes to you what um okay so thank you money what other courses do you teach um the thank you money is the main is the main one i have some free courses i have one called the game changers journey mm, um that? which is it's a little it's a tiny little ebook it's the same size as my phone <laughs> um, and it describes the challenges that most game changers, conscious business owners, people who are purpose driven experience. And many of them think that those challenges, let's say they have a challenge in their relationship or with their kids or they have a challenge or they start to feel depressed and they're supposed to be filled by purpose, you know, um, or they have a health challenge. And they usually think that those challenges are somehow separate and they must get on with their mission. And what the Games Changers journey explains is, is how those challenges are right in the heart of your mission. They're like, they're your Batman training um, that open up all the abilities that you need in order to, to achieve your mission, whatever it is. So I think it's a very important little, tiny little book. And there's a talk about it to help us to understand the modern Game Changers journey. That's like the modern hero's journey. Well, that's interesting because throughout my life, I've been able to meet a lot of a lot of people who are authors and speakers and you know transformational leaders. And hanging around them for a while, you start to see where their Achilles heel is, or you know, yes. it's often relationships. <laughs> it's uh, yep. you know the parts of their life that aren't working. And yep. I think this is an interesting approach that that it's part of the mission. Uh, you know, it's so powerful. I've worked with whole families um, and also couples and individuals. And those challenges with their relationships or with their family or you have a child maybe, maybe who's depressed or something like that, mm -hmm. those are the opportunities for us to grow our capacity for love. But... We don't usually take it that way. We get afraid and we get worried and we, we go into all kinds of negative spaces and we often lose the opportunity to grow our capacity for love. But that capacity for love is what will make your mission successful. And if you don't take that practice from your relationship, it's like, how, how are you going to learn that if it's not in a real situation? Because love has to be for real. You can talk beautiful things about love as a transformational leader, but love is for real. It's not, it's not for talking. And it's not easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's oh, not, I know. It's I not know. easy. I don't find it easy, but I find it really valuable. Hmm. Okay. Um, what other courses do you teach? I have an advanced course, which is called The Leading Edge, which is for people who've done a lot of personal development and who are game changers. Mm -hmm. So that's it's kind of the leading edge of my work and helping them to be on the leading edge of their work. Um, and if we go back to the free ones, I have a couple of other free courses. One of them is called Heal Your Relationship with Money, which is, is some activations for healing your relationship with money. And the other one's called Work Lighter, Get Richer, which uh, I've done a lot of work around what I call working light, which is instead of working hard. Mm -hmm. And it's based in relaxation again. It's a very specific little kind of relaxation protocol, if you like, that has the most remarkable effects in, in productivity, not heavy productivity, mm -hmm. kind of light productivity, just being able to do way more, make way less mistakes, get way more co cooperation from other people. So Work Like, Get Richer is an ebook that 
describes a bit about working light and also this stuff about money. That really interests me <laughs> because I know, <laughs> I don't know, it seems like the new generation, the teenagers now, they don't seem to want to work, but um, <laughs> from what I'm seeing, but I think you, you know, say that about every generation of teenagers. <laughs> that could be. Uh, we, we like to think we're all different, and, but uh, yeah. but we have been raised with, you know, that you, you work hard, right? And, and Absolutely. get where you're going. And uh, I don't think that it has to be that way. I'm quite clear that it doesn't. One of the central messages of my book was simply that you don't have to work hard in the way that you think you do. And the book, the money came to speak to us, to show us a simpler more joyful, more enjoyable way. Actually, it talks about enjoyment a lot and says sometimes like, why can't you get it? Why can't you get that it's really okay to enjoy and that enjoyment is the key to money, relaxation and enjoyment. So um, yes, I think that it's very, very timely because the way people are working when they work so hard is short term. And I, I think a lot of people, they're so exhausted because they're working so hard, so they don't really get to enjoy the, the benefits of the money they're making. That's right. And they, it, it's difficult when you're exhausted. You can't really enjoy yourself. So you have to do very strong things to stimulate enjoyment. So you have to drink a lot or you have to go watch really strong movies, which is like to get some stimulation because you're so, um, you've forced yourself so much to work hard. You've actually switched off a lot of your energy. So, so um, what I find is important is to switch on your energy because then the subtle enjoyment kicks in and you just start to feel good. And when you feel good, you don't want to treat yourself so badly anymore. And so, it, again, you, it, it's that spiraling upwards. When you start to be kinder to yourself, you feel better. And then you get a taste for feeling better. You don't want to go back to that really hard way of doing things. And so there's a natural progression from learning this. It's it's not as hard, I think, as the traditional ways of learning personal development. You don't have to push yourself and implement so much. You can actually relax into it and it works. That makes sense. I mean, a lot of people, they don't even take their vacation time. So I hear, it's an American habit. <laughs> That's what I liked about working for myself. I can do what I want when I want. <laughs> yeah. you, you know. Wow. So, I mean, this really is, a, for most people, I think it's really a different way of looking at money and how we relate to it. And it probably would, especially in the beginning, it would be a big help to uh, have someone to help guide them, or at least uh, like look into your courses. How, how would people connect with you if they're interested in, in this and they want to explore it more? The easiest thing is to go to my website, which is just my name. It's sarahmccrum.com, um, and you can find everything from there. Okay. And do you spell Sarah with an H? Or? Yes, Sarah with an H, and McCrum is M-C-C-R-U-M. And it's dot com? Dot com, yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's great. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share about all of this that we haven't touched on yet that would you think would be helpful for people? Yes, there's something that comes to mind that I feel is really important and has emerged for me gradually or is emerging for me and feels important for this time. When we have... A relationship with money that is based in love and appreciation and generosity and the things we've been talking about, we are able to create more beauty in the world. And beauty becomes part of our work. And to me, that's that in itself is a very beautiful thing. I, it, it's, it feels good to contribute to more beauty in the world. And I feel that that speaks to our soul. It speaks to our longing as a human being to appreciate the beauty of the place where we live, but also to contribute to it rather than always feel that what humans do is somehow detrimental. Because we've got that so strongly now that everything we do as human beings is like polluting and is somehow negative. But actually, we have great capacity to create beauty. Mm -hmm. 
And human beauty sat alongside nature's beauty is, a, is an a, incredible thing. And I feel that if we as a society and as individuals in that society can create more beauty, that's a very simple path to improve our, our civilization, our culture. And this kind of relationship with money opens up your capacity to create more beauty. I find that as a, it's a sort of, it feels really good to me that it's like that. Mm -hmm. I, that's such a universal thing mm -hmm. to appreciate beauty. We can all appreciate beauty and we can also all do something that adds to the beauty of the world. We can do little things every single day and then it quickly accumulates. So I feel it's very important at this time because otherwise we can get caught in quite a lot of ugliness. Yes, I agree. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, our, my family helped out another family who the mom hasn't been feeling well and the place was really a mess. And uh, all the boys went outside and, you know, weed whacked and mowed the lawn and made the outside look good and I was cleaning inside and picking up and it just felt so good because when we left everything looked so beautiful it looked so nice and and yeah. it was it just made me feel really good to be able to do that for somebody and perhaps sometimes things like that are more important than these massive goals that people create for themselves that that they have to trample all over so themselves and their own families and lots of other people to try to reach that goal. Perhaps sometimes just stepping back a little bit and doing something a bit smaller and really connecting with yourself and the people around you and, and beauty would contribute more to the world. Mm -hmm. I, I really feel that more and more, that, that we need to look at our goals and not to have, we don't need to have small goals, but we need to cultivate inside ourselves that thing that we really care about as well. And not say it's okay for me to, I'm, I'm a leader, so I go out and do things. It doesn't matter how I live, it just matters how everybody else lives. But it's about us as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know, like I so said, there are quite a few people around here who don't drive and uh, the buses become terrible. And when I know I'm going to go grocery shopping, I call and say, you know, can I get anything for you? Can I, or would yes. you like to come with me? You know, um, can I help you out in some way? And it's just a small thing, but you know, it can make a huge difference to somebody else. And yes. if we just all pay that forward, it can make a huge difference in so many people's lives. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it becomes kinder. Yes. I really like how you focus on kindness. It's, that's, something it's just a little different for me I mean a different way of expressing it and I really like that uh, if you don't mind I'm going to use that a lot more <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> well this has really been a delight and you know I, our list hopefully when I edit our listeners won't know but we've had all kinds of connection problems <laughs> and uh and and even with that, this has been such a delight. I've really enjoyed our conversation, and um, and I've learned a lot. And I'm I'm looking forward because I've looked over your website, but I I just hadn't had time yet to really explore it. And I'm I'm going to now, and yeah, and definitely start looking at your things. And um, I want to do the activations, and uh, I I want to explore what you have to offer. I, I think it's brilliant. great, as the English say, it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very English as you probably know <laughs> right that's why I thought I'd use it <laughs> yeah. well um, thank you so much Sarah uh, this has been delightful I will have to thank our mutual friend Karen Sperling she's been on the podcast it was quite a while ago but uh, for introducing me to you uh, I'm really grateful Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a really, a really interesting exploration and conversation. Yeah, yeah, they usually are. People so far, at when I get off of conversations with someone, everybody's always said it's been fun or they've really enjoyed it. So I guess I'm doing something okay. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> okay, well, you take care, stay safe and stay well. And uh, I, I really appreciate the work you're doing. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah McCrump, for sharing your work with us. And I have no doubt that 
many will benefit because so many have an adversarial relationship with money and you need to have that gratitude, that sincerity, appreciation, generosity, and change your relationship with money. The podcast website is realjanine.com where you can listen to or download episodes and click on links to my guest information. And remember, once again, Janine is J-A-N-E-A-N. To subscribe to Keeping It Real with Janine, simply go to your favorite podcast provider and check out my podcast YouTube channel with video slideshows of all my conversations. Do you know someone who would benefit from my conversation with Sarah? This would be a really good conversation to share with your family and friends. So please do so. We'd all appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Take care and always be well.